Hello and welcome to Avi's Conversational Corner, a podcast on history, culture, and politics in a broad perspective. I am your host, Avi Wolf. You can find this and other episodes like it on Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube, and you can help support the podcast through Patreon. It was a time of rapid, terrifying, and exhilarating change, a time of scientific breakthroughs, mass politics, endless scandals, and efforts at reform. A time when new groups of Americans fought for and sometimes won their right to participate fully in American life, while others did their best to try and keep America as it was, or as they imagined it to be. With few heroes, many villains, great geniuses, and piercing questions, many of which still trouble us today. Welcome to Stumbling Colossus, a regular part of Avi's conversational corner, covering the gilded and progressive ages of the United States, from the end of the Civil War to the end of the First World War. This episode's topic the Railroad's Color Line. The railroad brought opportunity to all Americans in the Gilded Age, including Black Americans, among them the millions of freed slaves from the Civil War. Indeed, it can be said that at least in the South, Black Americans built or rebuilt much of the railroad. But the silver lining came with many clouds, lower pay than whites, harder labor, little possibility of advancement, and being treated like natural servants by most passengers. How and why did Black Americans flock so much to work on the railroad nevertheless? How did they cope with a society that saw them as at the bottom of the totem pole? And how much were they able to organize and enjoy the benefits that they did get from working on the railroad and traveling along the same? With me to answer some of these questions and more is Professor Eric Arneson, author of Brotherhoods of Color, Black Railroad Workers and the Struggle for Equality. Eric, welcome. Thanks for having me. Pleasure's all mine. So let me start with the question I ask almost all my guests uh, on, in this series. Let us imagine a uh, an aspiring Black American journalist, say from a proto-Chicago defender type, um, looks into the condition of Black American workers uh, on the railroad throughout the United States at the beginning of our period, say the, the late 60s, the middle of our period, around the 1890s, and the end of our period, after the First World War. What would he find? What would have changed? What would have stayed the same? That aspiring journalist for the proto-Chicago defender would have, at the beginning of this period, in the aftermath of the Civil War, the launching of the experiment known as Reconstruction, would have blinked and perhaps missed the obvious. Not all former enslaved people labored in agriculture. The vast majority did, but not all. And the expanding railroad networks in the country and the rebuilding and building of railroads in the South afforded employment to a small but significant number of African Americans. And what this journalist would have observed are former slaves working to lay rails, uh, to clear forests, uh, to drain swampland, uh, to kind of construct the infrastructure of the railway system. So the bulk of this small but not insignificant number of, of workers um, worked in kind of construction of the rail system. A smaller number of that small number could be found, say, in the operating trades. So trainmen and brake brakemen and firemen, for example, uh, you would find African Americans uh, on board trains uh, performing the heavy labor uh, that was required uh, to run these uh, locomotives. Um, and you would see, say, starting in 1867 or so, uh, a small but growing number of African Americans securing work as Pullman porters. Uh, and in addition, you would see a number as, say, um, uh, cooks uh, and waiters uh, on board trains as well. If you fast forward to the end of the century, the rail system is larger, the labor force is larger, and the number of African Americans in the industry is somewhat larger. Yes, they're still concentrated um, in 
construction and maintenance. Their ranks uh, amongst service workers uh, has expanded. The Pullman Company now employs thousands and thousands of former slaves on its so-called hotels on wheels. Um, And to the traveling public and Many white Americans and European travelers would write travelogues uh, and they would see uh, the ranks of of the service sector uh, dominated uh, by African-Americans. What you would not see is a substantial growth in the number of operating trades employees. Yes, there are still black trainmen. There are still black firemen, uh, but they have plenty of competition uh, from their white counterparts uh, for these particular jobs. And at the end of this period of time, if we're talking the immediate aftermath of World War I, um, all of what I've just said still applies, uh, but two additional things might be added. First, an astute observer writing, in this case, for, say, the Chicago Defender, which now exists, uh, or other Black papers, would have been cognizant of something of a labor upheaval uh, during the war. White trade unions expanded by leaps and bounds uh, during the war years, facilitated by a tight economy on the one hand, and a federal government that was overseeing uh, parts of the economy, the railroads uh, included. Uh, So white labor expands uh, dramatically, but so too uh, does kind of the smaller tradition of African-American Uh, trade unions, um, something that is often overlooked uh, in historical accounts uh, done by people in my business, um, the history profession, you know, over the years. So this astute observer would have noted significant numbers of African-American workers joining trade unions um, in significant numbers um, and engaging in workplace activism. Uh, And indeed, uh, while there was no one such reporter There were many reporters, Uh, and now in the age of digital newspapers, through newspapers.com, ProQuest's tremendous uh, digitization project, uh, uh, Chronicling America, the Library of Congress's uh, program, uh, Gale, Redex, uh, other companies making available state historical societies, digitizing local and African-American newspapers, Uh, one might have a much easier job locating identifying, assembling, and synthesizing this tradition. Um, Years ago, before digitization was common, I spent vast quantities of time in front of microfilm readers um, looking for needles in a haystack. I mean, hour after hour, week after week. Um, This was a significant chunk of my earlier life as a professional historian. Um, uh, You know, and and even then I was able to kind of uncover and identify uh, large amounts of of Black trade union activity. Uh, Now in the digitization era, It's much easier for historians. You're no longer looking for needle in a haystack. You know, you have computer programs can do that and they can pull out lots and lots and lots of needles. Um, So all this is to say, this is a a, a significant uh, uh, development, uh, this growth of black trade unionism. But like its white counterpart, there's a rise and there's a fall. Uh, And the post-war era 1919, 1920 through 1922 sees tremendous labor upheaval in the country. And when the smoke clears, capital wins. Uh, Businesses by and large prevail. Many of the gains achieved by organized labor are rolled back. And this is true for black workers uh, as well as white workers. Um, But the other thing One last point here that this astute observer uh, would have have noted, um, or I hope would have noted, um, is that as the economy sours in the post-war period, there is a acceleration of anti-Black violence in the railway industry. This is an industry, and I could talk about this all day, that that is highly stratified by race. I've identified some of the positions that Black workers had access to. The positions that they didn't have access to uh, were the best paid ones. So if you want to be a railway conductor uh, or uh, uh, an engineer and you're African-American, forget it. 
It's not happening. These jobs are lily white. They remain white, uh, you know, well into the 1950s and 1960s. But the positions of brakemen and firemen that I mentioned earlier, where you do have some black workers gaining access to these jobs, they come under attack in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, and white brakemen and firemen go out on strike uh, to reduce the number of black workers. Uh, there is a wave of terrorism uh, that spreads across the Deep South in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, uh, in which white workers literally shoot and kill uh, black trainmen uh, in an effort to dissuade them from retaining their jobs. Uh, this recedes, but there's another wave of terrorism with the same purpose uh, in the early 1930s uh, during the Great Depression. So that's a long-winded answer um, for what a aspiring reporter might have seen uh, at those three moments in time. That's certainly a lot to take in. Um, so let me uh, start by addressing one of the first two, one of the first two points that, uh, that, that you've made that I'd like to address. You mentioned the trade labor union, the rise in trade labor unionism among black Americans. In your other work, uh, which you sent me before this interview, you note that black Americans had a, what I, I guess I would call a very ambivalent attitude towards the idea of joining a union or being part of a union or even just being sympathetic to a union because uh, in many cases, and especially on the railroads, uh, unions were pr practically said, we'd rather be subject, we'd rather the boss kick us around than we have a Black American as our partner. And also that um, Black Americans themselves, not because they, they hated unions, but because they needed the job, were often used as quote unquote scabs or strike breakers to uh, to work in various uh, trades and indeed even on the railroads. Part of why strikes wouldn't work was because blacks could often be brought in to do the same job. So how did how how did how did that change from say the Gilded Age where they're really not so sure to World War One saying you know what we'll join we'll form unions but on our own terms and for our own benefit. Very good question. Very important question. So Black Americans, like their white counterparts, are no monolith. They don't speak with one voice. They don't think about developments in the United States in identical ways. Um, place, personality, circumstance, and the like all play into this. In the Gilded Age, uh, let's say, in the 1880s and 1890s. Really, m most Americans, white and black, are outside the ranks of organized labor. Um, so this is not just something that, that is you know, unique to African Americans. Um, but African Americans have particular reasons for not joining unions. First, many unions don't want them. Um, the white workers uh, in these organizations uh, make it very clear uh, that uh, the solidarity of labor ends at the color line. Uh, solidarity amongst white workers does not extend to African-American workers. Uh, in the case of the railroads, uh, the railway, the big railway brotherhoods, um, uh, the firemen, brakemen, conductors and engineers all have constitutions that make it very clear that membership is reserved for members of the white race, period, right? So you couldn't join even if white workers wanted them uh, to join if you were a black worker. Uh, so that barrier was really quite strong. The Knights of Labor that rises significantly uh, to embrace a minority but very noticeable number of, of workers in the 1880s is an exception. Uh, and it makes it very clear uh, that it does not recognize racial barriers, ah, with the exception, of course, of Asian immigrants. Uh, under no circumstances would they be admitted uh, into uh, uh, labor's ranks. But African Americans were technically, theoretically, uh, rhetorically welcomed into the labor movement. Now, in practice, this might mean a black local and a white local, not necessarily an integrated local. Uh, but still, uh, the Knights of Labor talked a good game even if in practice it didn't always live up to its own rhetoric. Um, 
But still, uh, the vast majority of African Americans remain in agriculture. And while there are agricultural unions here and there that are short lived, um, including the Knights of Labor organizing sugar workers, say in Louisiana uh, in the uh, mid late uh, 1880s, uh, those strikes are rather mercilessly crushed um, by employers, vigilantes, local police, state troops, and the like. But in terms of the larger picture, the fact that many trade unions, at least outside of the Knights of Labor, have no interest uh, in Black members, um, this gives rise to a very understandable response. We're not wanted. White labor is not our friend. Uh, white labor is seeking the jobs that we might have. Um, so there is no common ground uh, between us. I've written about an earlier tradition of Black labor activism uh, that makes a point that I will reiterate here is that when we talk about the labor movement, we need to realize that it is not and was not ever the sole property of white workers. OK, I think that's how the labor movement is often seen. Uh, Samuel Gompers, the American Federation of Labor, exclusionary policies, labor movement equals white. Uh, and while certainly the AFL was highly discriminatory, many of its constituent unions excluded African-Americans, uh, the railroad brotherhoods, lily white and fiercely and proudly so. Uh, so I'm not trying to underplay that. But outside of this particular structure, Black workers had some needs. They had a need for better working conditions, higher wages, uh, a certain modicum of dignity on the job that was denied to them uh, on the basis of, of their race. Uh, and in many communities, Black workers organized independently outside of the larger structure of the American Federation of Labor, say, uh, to pursue those particular goals. Were they successful? Mm, not always, not often necessarily. At times they had more success than they did uh, at other times. But a generation of labor and African-American historians have worked to kind of reconstitute uh, aspects of this tradition uh, that I think are, are very, very important. You mentioned a point about access to employment or the need for jobs. And you know, so, yes, um, um, in the larger titanic battles between capital and labor in the Gilded Age and in the Progressive Era, employers sought to break strikes of white workers. And they did so by securing strike breakers in significant numbers. Now, in many instances, these strike breakers are white um, because they're simply more white workers. Uh, they could be immigrants from Europe um, or they might be. African Americans. And when contemporaries thought about strike breakers in the late 19th, early 20th century, the image of the black strike breaker loomed large. But if you were to do a census of all strike breakers, and you can't because that data isn't really available uh, in any, any uh, 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 reliable way, you would find a majority of strike breakers uh, being, being white. Uh, and yet, that's not the image uh, that uh, uh, has, has uh, maintained. During the First World War, one key difference from the earlier period um, is the federal government's role in overseeing labor relations. The government had a objective interest in maintaining labor peace, uh, of reducing labor turnover. After all, there was a war to be fought uh, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, the economic dislocations uh, of migration and or strikes were to be minimized to the best of the government's ability. So various boards are created in the hopes that Labor could be con con convinced to not engage in strikes or to walk off the job in too significant numbers um, uh, and to bring uh, some degree of stability to the industry. Now, what this means for black workers, say, in the railroad industry is literally for the first time, they have someone else, a different institution that is able to listen to or willing to listen to their complaints. Um, uh, and an agency that has a interest uh, in at least entertaining their grievances because massive turnover, if wages are so low 
uh, that that black workers are flooding out of common labor positions uh, on the railroads to take better paid positions, say, in the steel industry or some other industry. Um, this is disruptive. So the government has an incentive uh, to listen to and to attempt to address within limits. They're not going to go too far uh, these these complaints. Um, so there's this, uh, sometimes uh, wage increases are offered. Sometimes rules are adopted uh, that will mitigate some of the worst uh, conditions. Uh, and so black workers have organized. They dispatch their leaders. They testify um, before uh, these various boards and they get something sometimes. Uh, and this makes a difference. But this is also a period of tremendous kind of organizational upsurge. So as I said earlier, White workers are organizing in significant numbers and black workers, too. Um, if you expand this a little bit, there's other kinds of protests that's going on. The NAACP has been founded uh, in the end of the first decade of the 20th century, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Yes, it pursues a strategy of litigation and lobbying, attempting to kind of chip away at the edifice of Jim Crow uh, in various uh, uh, angles and aspects uh, of, of American life. But the numbers of people joining the NAACP uh, in the war and immediate uh, post-war years skyrockets. Uh, and Stephen Reich, a, a terrific historian um, uh, of the Great Migration, amongst many other things, you know, has made a convincing case um, that kind of the, the labor upsurge uh, also was reflected in the increased numbers of working class African-Americans, including Southerners, uh, urban and, and rural, uh, who joined the NAACP. Other historians have pointed to Garvey, uh, Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, whose numbers, while often inflated uh, in the uh, accounts by Garvey and his historians, were still significant, um, that there's a lot going on. And the phrase, the new Negro, uh, enters again uh, into American uh, discussions and conversations uh, about race. Uh, a new Negro, as A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owens Messenger magazine would put it, uh, is not going to take it lying down. Uh, and so when there are race riots breaking out in 1919, uh, Randolph and Owen and others will say Black Americans will fight back. Um, uh, you will pick up a gun. You will defend yourself um, uh, against uh, uh, trepidation of, 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 of depredations by by white uh, uh, assailants. Um, so this is a moment. Now, as I said earlier, also, it doesn't fully last. Uh, and many of these organizational gains for white labor, for black labor, NAACB membership, you know, drops off as well. Um, uh, the impact of race riots and pogroms in the South um, uh, cumulatively um, uh, take a, a a a real shot uh, at the black uh, the black organizational upsurge uh, in these years uh, and or part of the 20s at any rate. Uh, yes, the new Negro may be a cultural phenomenon in places like Harlem and Chicago, um, but the vibrant working class, you know, organizational infrastructure that emerged and expanded during uh, the war years uh, is far less uh, visible uh, than it once was. This will again change in the 1930s and in the 1940s. Great summary. I thought I might uh, go back to what you were talking about, how they're starting to or, uh, organize and see each other together. Uh, in his wonderful book, uh, From Mutual Aid to Welfare State, David Beto talks about how the Gilded Age and Progressive Age is an era in which Americans are organizing for a million different purposes, and especially to help each other out. And he notes that this is true even of the most disadvantaged populations, including uh, black Americans. I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about, in addition to fighting for wages and better working conditions, how much did uh, black Americans working on the railroad see each other as a community to help each other out in all sorts of cases, say work injuries were common um, or uh, helping out their communities, uh, things like that? So I would not pull black railroad workers out of the dense networks of community organizations, religious organizations um, that structured urban or even rural Black life uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, decades ago, 
Um, this was maybe around 1980 or so. Peter Ratcliffe uh, came out with something of a path-breaking book about black labor enrichment, uh, charting the transition from slavery to freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and using the records of the Freedmen's Bank, he managed to essentially reconstruct uh, this dense network of African-American kind of fraternal and religious and labor organizations, um, uh, uh, you know, health and death benefits societies um, that really shouldn't have existed if Black communities weren't organized uh, when slavery fell, except that they were organized. And this was a foundation that they could could expand upon uh, in the work that I did on New Orleans. Um, you know, from from the transition from slavery to freedom through the end of the century into the 21st century, you know, I was struck again and again and again in the primary sources uh, infor- by, with information about Black organizational life. The infrastructure was substantial. At times, some Black newspaper editors were complaining that there was just too much going on. There were too many organizations. There were too many activities taking place. Uh, and maybe the community's uh, economic resources could be better spent, you know, doing this, this, or that. Um, uh, and so Black workers, railroad workers, the dock workers that I studied in New Orleans, um, the uh, the domestic servants and washerwomen that Tara Hunter uh, studied in uh, in uh, uh, Atlanta, uh, the coal miners uh, that Dan Letwin and Karen Shapiro uh, study in in uh, Alabama and East Tennessee are all embedded uh, in these larger community religious fraternal networks um, that uh, you know basically constitute um, uh, solidarities that overlap with, but are somewhat independent of the existence of a union. Um, So Black trade union leaders in New Orleans uh, from the Longshoremen's Union, and I wrote about this in a book called Waterfront Workers of New Orleans that came out in 1991, um, were part and parcel of political clubs, uh, Republican Party ward organizations, uh, religious and fraternal groups uh, as well. Uh, And the same would extend uh, to railroad workers in many instances. If you fast forward into the 20s and 30s, um, Pullman Porters, um, when not traveling, seeing the country uh, um, uh, as part of their jobs, you know, are civic pillars. Uh, and you read the black press from the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, and these men and the women in their families that are part of this Pullman Porter community are, to put it mildly, extremely active um, in social, religious, and political affairs uh, in black America. That's a great answer. Uh, I thought I might... This is going to veer a bit sharply, but it's nevertheless a question that's been uh, bothering me since I started studying this period. Reading about Black Americans in the South, they're clearly often exploited or 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 taken advantage of, uh, but they're nevertheless employed. And yet, when I read about Black Americans working on the railroad, there appeared to be almost an invisible color line saying, you can only work in the South and can't get work in the more remunerative uh, northern and midwestern lines, at least until the First World War. And I'm thinking, let's think you're the most ruthless capitalist person alive. You know, you'll pay them, I don't know, half the wages. Why was there why was there no interest or desire to, quote unquote, exploit this uh, source of uh, uh, of labor uh, prejudices or no? So the answer to that question is in part demographic and is part ideological. And on the demographic side, the vast number of African-Americans live in the American South. Yes, there is some migration, but not like it would become in the First World War and the 1920s and again in the 1940s and uh, after And the noticeable lack of or small amount of migration in part is related to the availability of employment. 
So there are not many African-Americans in the North compared to the South, but there are a lot of new immigrants uh, in the North. And so if you have to lay track, if you have to maintain that track, you have access to a different low-wage labor pool uh, that is, at least for a portion of this period, unorganized, exploitable. Um, uh, they can be pitted against one another uh, on the basis of national origin or uh, ethnicity. You don't need African-American workers because you've got no immigrants. And that changes substantially for the first time with the Great War breaking out in 1914 and the vast reduction in the number of immigrants coming to the United States and the American economy responding to war orders from allies abroad, um, the economy starts to hum. And so employers need labor uh, and they don't have access to this other pool of immigrant labor that they once did. And so they put their thinking caps on and they conclude that there are two sources, three actually, um, um, women. So to some degree, women break into uh, job categories that they they were completely excluded from before and will be excluded from again. Um, in the Southwest, Mexican and Mexican-Americans make some gains. Um, and now they're willing to entertain African-American labor uh, in places like steel factories and other industries uh, of the North. So they get African-American workers now get a foothold uh, in in these firms, the the packing houses of Chicago, you know, undergo something of a demographic transformation, you know, during these years, you know, before the war, you know, it's like a pre-United Nations uh, of new immigrant groups populating the factories on the south side of the city. Now, African-Americans who have had a little foothold before expand that foothold significantly. So now employers tap a new source of labor. African-Americans move in significant numbers, uh, half a million uh, during the war, uh, another 700,000 perhaps during the 1920s, uh, and they expand that foothold uh, uh, in, in industry. Now, the railroads, there too, uh, employers need them. They send labor agents. We need you on the Pennsylvania Railroad. We need you to do construction work. We need you to do maintenance work, you know, so they can get these jobs. But what they don't get are those engineering jobs, the conductor's jobs, and firemen and brakemen in the North are white. And they're organized. And they make it very clear that this is not going to change. Um, you know, we want to, uh, uh, you know, the union uh, uh, is is uh, membership is a requirement uh, of employment in many instances. Uh, and uh, since blacks cannot be members of the union, this is a non-conversation. Uh, and so these jobs remain essentially all white um, in the post-World War I period as well. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the one area of tension that that increases particularly with the economic downturn right after the war and again in the economic crisis of the 1930s, in those places where blacks and whites both constitute a portion of the brakeman or fireman uh, labor force, whites want more jobs. Um, so they begin to encroach uh, on black jobs. Uh, and they think very creatively uh, about how they're going to get their way. And so there are these percentage agreements, um, you know, so if in 50-50 now it needs to be 60-40 or something greater. Uh, and if we can't get this by striking and threatening to tie everything up, I alluded earlier to the terrorism campaigns to voluntarily uh, induce African-Americans to relinquish their position upon pain of death if they don't. Um, uh, so again, right after the war, and again, in the early 1930s. Uh, so that conflict becomes becomes manifest. Um, but otherwise, uh, the demographic factor is key. And I also mentioned an ideological factor. Um, Southern employers, I don't want to say made their peace with an African-American labor force, but that was their labor force, <laughs> their unskilled labor force. Uh, and their ideological assumptions about innate African-American inferiority, subordination, uh, character traits, uh, and the like, um, what they believed 
during the period of slavery is carried over uh, into the period of emancipation. Uh, and black workers will only work if closely supervised and managed, often with a degree of authoritarianism and brutality on white managers' part, and they're going to make sure that that happens. Um, and in the North, since they haven't had to reckon with that to the same degree, um, you can read during the 19 uh, teens um, industry magazines uh, in which managers quite openly be kind of discuss, you know, how do we manage our labor force? You know, and so the Italians need to be handled a certain way. The Hungarians, another way. Uh, uh, Southern Negroes, as they would say, um, yet another way. Uh, and so, you know, they import many of these assumptions from the South. Uh, but now that they got them, they got to manage them. Uh, and, you know, using the strong arm uh, and to enforce rules and regs uh, is something that they quite openly talk about. Uh, to read management journals, um, you know, in this period uh, is to get a very clear sense uh, that racial notions uh, are ubiquitous, uh, that different character traits are assigned to different ethnic groups. Uh, no code words need to be engaged. There's no one being embarrassed by talking as bluntly as they do about innate inferiority or this or that characteristic of this or that people. Um, racism is not just ubiquitous, um, but it's vocal. It's unembarrassed uh, on the part of whites. Uh, and historians or others you know, reading these journals are transported to a completely different world uh, in which race is everywhere. Uh, racial notions pervade every aspect uh, of, of how management thinks about the assembling of and the maintenance of its labor force. Speaking of transporting to a different world, I thought I might end our discussion in asking you, say someone would like to, in addition to this wonderful conversation, learn more about the experience of Black Americans on the railroad. Where would they, where would they find more and where would they learn more? You mean other than my brotherhoods of color? In uh, addition, Theodore, to <laughs> Theodore Cornweebel uh, wrote a absolutely terrific uh, book uh, and very well illustrated um, uh, that uh, covers the years that we've been talking about uh, and beyond. Um, uh, he was a prolific uh, historian uh, of uh, African American protest and federal repression uh, during the World War One uh, era and the 1920s. Uh, and one of his last books uh, was about the African-American uh, experience uh, on uh, the railroad. Uh, right here, uh, Miriam uh, Thaggart's uh, writing Jim, Jane Crow, African-American Women uh, on the American Railroad, um, is a book that covers areas that Cornwee, Bill, and I did not cover. Um, uh, so there's a literature out there uh, that one uh, can find. And if you're willing to go forward in time, uh, to look at the 20s and 1930s and 40s, the literature on Pullman Porters uh, is significant. Um, this is a, 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 a occupational category and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, a particular African-American union uh, that historians have not shied away from. Uh, and they haven't shied away from it in part because, well, the porters were very conscious that they were making history and they left a tremendous paper trail in archives across the country. Uh, and as a result, it's made historians' job of reconstructing that union's history much easier than it is of many of the other organizations. When I wrote Brotherhoods of Color, um, uh, uh, trying to kind of uh, explore the world of red caps, uh, the black men who carried passengers bags in railway stations in the late 19th, early uh, 20th century um, was immensely more difficult, you know, in part because the red caps, you know, left behind a paper trail like this compared to, you know, what the, the, the Pullman porters uh, uh, left behind. Uh, and the dining car workers uh, left even less uh, than the uh, red caps. At least they had a newspaper in the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, so the availability of sources, um, you know, is absolutely key. And the porters, I guess, knew what they were doing. Uh, and, that paper trail uh, is rich and has resulted in a very rich body of literature um, by uh, historians uh, like uh, Beth Tompkins Bates, uh, Larry Ty, uh, and many others.
Excellent. Uh, Professor Arneson, I'd like you. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'd like to once again remind my listeners that you can listen to this podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube, and you can support the podcast on Patreon. See you all next time in Avi's Conversational Corner. <laughs>